Hello, and welcome to the Urban Exodus Podcast, a show that celebrates country living and shares the stories of people who are crafting creative, sustainable, and self-sufficient lives in the country. My name is Alyssa Hessler, and I'm the founder of Urban Exodus. I'm so glad to have you with us. A movement is underway of people abandoning the emotional, physical, and financial expense of city living and crafting their own purpose, livelihoods, and joy in the rural reaches. Although each person's story is unique, they share the same desires of reconnecting with the natural world, becoming more self-reliant, and having space to breathe and room to grow. This podcast celebrates those brave enough to follow their bliss down the road less traveled. In today's episode, I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Stephen Carter. Stephen is a farmer at Scribe Winery and grows delicious farm-to-table fare for Scribe's Tasting Room in the Sonoma Valley. Putting some seed in the ground and turning it into something that you can eat and that somebody can turn into an amazing dish that people take joy out of is a, a pretty cool thing. Stephen became interested in growing while employed at famed restaurant Chez Panisse. Working in the farm-to-table fine dining world, Stephen discovered how high-quality ingredients transformed even the simplest meals. He relocated from San Francisco to California's wine country to learn natural process agriculture at Green String Institute. I first met Stephen back in November of 2019 when I toured his tasting room farm operation. We discussed the obstacles young farmers face, especially those without land access or startup capital from family. These generational wealth barriers make it nearly impossible to get a farm up and running. As one of a handful of black farmers in California's wine country, he isn't one to sugarcoat the deep systemic issues that prevent people of color from considering a career in agriculture. Stephen wants to dispel stigmas and stereotypes and help even the playing field so that more people of color have a pathway into farming. One day, he plans to build a farm of his own, where he can continue to share his love of great food and sustainable agriculture. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us today. First things first, tell us about your relationship to food and the outdoors and what guided and inspired you to pursue a career in agriculture. I was just kind of looking for a way to work outside and fell into farming. My mom ran the food service program at Stanford University, and I think that definitely had an impact on the way I viewed food as a child. I definitely was a picky eater and didn't want anything to do with vegetables or anything that was coming from the kitchen, basically. But I think it had an inherent influence on me for sure. My dad was also in the Forest Service in Wyoming in the 70s and had a real love for nature. Um, And we used to go out a lot as a kid. So I think that definitely had an impact as well. When I was attending the University of Utah in the summer, I needed a job. And my dad's buddy, who he knew from the landscape architecture program out there, he had a little farm at his house that he had been working on for 40 years or something. And he kind of started the farmer's market in that town as well. But he was getting too old to do the labor. So he kind of let me do some work for him. In that town, it like backs up right against a mountain. Um, And so they were using flood irrigation. So I was just digging ditches for him. I was kind of overseas for a while and I came back home and my parents had moved up to Sonoma County and I was staying with them and I needed a job. And I was sort of really on my like nature kick after living in Utah and parts of Wyoming and Montana. And I ended up getting a job as a ranch hand, but then that shut down and I ended up moving down to Oakland and working at a restaurant in Berkeley. Steven got a job at Alice Waters famed farm to table restaurant, Chez Panisse. On his first day on the job, Steven met Bob Kennard, and he invited him to join his farm intern program at Green String Institute in Petaluma. Although Steven loved working at Chez Panisse, his desire to work outdoors eventually got the better of him, and he moved to Green String to begin the program three months after his chance meeting with Bob. 
After the completing the program, Stephen stayed on at Green String for several months before getting a job farming for the shed in Healdsburg. I went up to Healdsburg and I ran the produce garden for this place called Shed. So there was like an event space, two restaurants, a market place and the owners had a pretty large property where they had a a market garden. I ran that and everything I grew there went to the kitchen of the restaurant. Where are you working now and what's your role there? I'm working at Scribe Winery in Sonoma, California, and I'm running the vegetable garden at the tasting room. Everything I grow goes to the kitchen which Kelly Mariani runs all the herbs and root vegetables and maybe cherry tomatoes and squash and cucumbers. How long have you been working there? I've been here for a little over a year. And how do you collaborate to know what crops you're going to grow and quantities and all of that? I know it can be very challenging to grow specifically for a kitchen. Well, luckily, there's lots of farms in the area that provide amazing produce as well. So I don't have to make sure that I can provide the kitchen with everything because we're quite busy. So that would be a monumental task. But during the winter months, you know, I kind of go through the catalog and look what I'm really interested in and talk to Kelly and, you know, ask her what she's really into and and try to narrow things down. I try to grow pretty heirloom stuff that you might not be able to find at a farmer's market or a grocery store. How many acres are you growing on? It's uh, just under two. And do you have any agricultural principles or something? Is it all organic? Um, Are you using no-till? Like what what practices are you using to uh, cultivate the vegetables that you're growing there? I get organic compost. I definitely use a BCS walk-behind tractor. I'm mostly on drip irrigation, but setting up some overhead. You know, I try to farm as much with hand power as possible and as little intervention as possible. I definitely don't like spray anything, but I use soil amendments, which are also organic. No-till would be nice, but I don't have that skill yet. What do you love the most about your job? Mm, I mean, again, the joy that you get from starting a seed in the greenhouse to like watch those first cotyledon come up and then putting it in the ground and watering it and hoeing the weeds away and bringing it to the kitchen and and seeing a chef's face when you bring something cool or just the joy that you get starting something and and turning it into food. It's just pretty amazing. It's almost a collaborative process, right? Between the farmer and the chef. It's pretty neat trying to stay on top of of the trends and and see what foods are going to jump up in in America and, and in the Bay Area and trying to be ahead of that because you you know you got to grow it four or five months ahead of time. It's a fun little game that you play with the chefs. I know this is something that's not always talked about, but what are some of the physical realities of farming? Everybody hurts their back like multiple times per season where you have to like take it easy and your knees are tired and sun damage is a huge issue for a lot of people, getting sunburns all the time. And there's a lot of alone time, which I think is a challenging thing to deal with. That's definitely hard. You know, I work at a a pretty busy place, but I still spend the majority of my day not even talking to anybody. Do you think that it's possible for someone new to farming to start a farm without any financial backing? Me and my roommate had a plot at home and we farmed that and sort of shopped it out to some of the restaurants in town. But it wasn't like we needed, like we both had our regular farm jobs and we were just kind of doing it just because we had space and wanted to test out doing something on our own without anybody telling us what to do. So, But we didn't have the burden of that being our financial support. So I can't speak on that for sure, but it seems pretty unlikely. You know, the profit margins are, are super small and land out here is is just insanely expensive. California is a state where people are already witnessing the horrifying effects of climate change. Are you worried about what the future will look like in California as the climate continues to warm? 
I think everybody should be just worried about the future of our planet in general. But I mean, it's growing up here, even not being part of the ag community, you can tell that it's hotter and drier. The fact that like so much of our produce for the state and the country comes from this area if the climate changes enough for it to not be so advantageous for people to farm here, it's going to, it's going to cost a lot of money to, to move the farming, say further North to like the Pacific Northwest where it, it might be less dry. You've been devastated by wildfires in the last few years. Is this constant climate change related threat making you reconsider where you live or your profession? You know, I still appreciate what I do and feel like I have a lot I can still learn and contribute to society. So I, I'm not like questioning what I'm doing in that regards. But uh, it is, you know, strange knowing that pretty much every year come fall, we're going to have to brace for, you know, some variation of trauma based on, you know, natural causes. I don't know. It just feels weird, really. Like the first couple years, it was more shocking. But now seeing that it like might just be a yearly thing, it really is putting in perspective, you know, climate change and and how naive we were thinking that we were far off from really being able to feel the effects to just like all of a sudden you're like, oh, we were already feeling it. But like now it's like, yeah, we're not just feeling it. It's like you might actually die or lose everything you have. And in addition to the wildfires, another big concern in California is the water supply. What are your thoughts on the future of water access in California? In the future, you know, water rights and the cost of water is, is going to be a huge issue. I think the Central Valley, there's a huge amount of farms and it's hotter and drier there. That's going to be a place where water rights become a huge thing. This season of the Urban Exodus podcast is brought to you by Jake.Art. Bring the beauty of the outdoors in. Search their collection of affordable, high-quality, fine art prints by color or theme to find just the right work for your home or office. Whether you need a visual escape into the beauty of the natural world while stuck indoors or want to send a thoughtful gift over the holidays, jake.art, that's J-A-K-E dot A-R-T, has you covered. The local foods movement is definitely growing, but it's still really only accessible to people in higher income brackets. Did it change your perspective working at a lot of these high-end restaurants about the culture surrounding the local foods movement and accessibility? I mean, for sure. Even just working at Shea, you know, the clientele there was very affluent. One, you know, that restaurant does a pretty good job of, of taking care of their staff or a great job, I should say, of taking care of their staff, which means like it's expensive to pay people what you're supposed to get paid and then to pay, you know, the high cost of elevated produce, that is expensive too. But when I was at Greenstring, you know, people were talking about what their plans were afterwards and a lot of people either had like land in the family or had some connection with land and I think it's it's you know it's clear that like if you are not from a certain class it's really difficult to break in the industry and and that class is usually broke down by racial lines. I want to be clear that obviously there's people that are more wealthy than me but both my parents like my mom was from Richmond and was poor and my dad was from Pennsylvania and then moved to Utah but like they both got college degrees and were both employed by Stanford University and, you know, did very well for themselves. And I wouldn't have been able to go and do the green stream program, which paid me nothing and go ranch and do all these jobs that really didn't pay me that much without the support of my parents. And I think a lot of people of color might not have had the same opportunity can you talk a little bit about generational family wealth and the role that plays in the lack of diversity in farming? It, it should be clear, but we don't really do a good job of 
being truthful about the history of the country, the wealth of this country is directly tied to the fact that it had free labor from its get-go and free land. And, you know, after slavery was over, there was an opportunity for all those people that had those skills, black people, in farming to, you know, try to make a living and, and get land. And some of that happened during Reconstruction. And I'm not, you know, a historian, but I've, I've read some stuff. But, you know, it it's pretty clear that you have a whole class of people that were the farm labor workforce and then they were freed to sort of try to pursue you know a way to build a life for their own and of course everybody kind of went into farming but then if you look now at the percentage of black people that own land or are farming in this country it's really small and you know you can say what you want but i think it's clear that there are there are laws that happened and then there are movements that were tied to racism that, you know, kept that working class from either being able to make it as farmers or even just exist as people in that space without being persecuted. And, you know, so people left and went North and laws around land and, misinformation or or just not even being part of the education system allowed people to be swindled out of their land or just not have any idea of what you need to do to make sure that your family can hold on to the land. What do you think needs to happen to fix our broken food system in the United States and make it more equitable and sustainable? Being honest about what's going on is a really good place to start and People being okay with taking an honest look at, you know, the history of the country and and why things are the way they are and what it has actually done. There's a a roadmap to where we are, and it usually is based off of institutional things that happened. And if you're just honest about what has taken place and why these things were allowed to happen and what the real ramifications of them were or are, you can at least go from there and start to have an honest conversation about what needs to be done. Do you have any advice for people of color who want to move to a rural area but are worried about feeling safe and accepted in their new community? You know, I was worried about that. I moved from San Francisco to Utah in like northern Utah. And sure, there are people that don't want you there and that aren't going to understand you. I think that there's like a false dichotomy around what it's like to be in California versus what it's like to be in a rural area. People face racism here just as much as in conservative places. Structurally, and the government is obviously a different thing. It's much more liberal here when we're talking about government policies, but it's a different kind of thing. You know, like you might get ignored here, whereas somebody will just say it to your face. In a, in a more rural place. I, I was reading a study about policing and they studied the percentage of the black population in, in some larger cities in California. And then they broke down how the pulled over rates by race and the highest discrepancy on per capita versus how much they were being pulled over was in San Francisco. So there was the lowest population of black people, but they were getting pulled over the most per capita out of all the st- the cities that they studied in California. And people want to say one thing about the Bay Area, but it's not as clear cut as as it is. And the same goes with rural areas. There's something to be said with people that talk straight to you. In the many interviews I've done over the years for Urban Exodus, the number one thing people say they dislike about living in the country is the lack of diversity. What would you say to those people? What can rural Americans do to work towards racial equality in our country and ensure their communities are welcoming to people of all races? You know, I would say something that might be more important is just you know, have the dialogue with people that are already there if you want to, like, do something, you know, just talk to 
the people that look like you that might not have the same kind of views as you and because I'm sure that people like that probably have very limited interaction with people like that being white people have very limited interaction with you know minorities and but have lots of things that they think about them um but if you're somebody that you know is seeking diversity or you know wants inclusivity you know, but it's not there you can at least forward that conversation with you know people that are in an area like that This episode is brought to you by Hessler Creative Workshops, a creative duo, spoil alert, it's my husband and I, offering both visual and destination photography workshops. Join us in our Creative Connection course running January 8th through 9th. Creative Connection meets once a week for group critiques paired with lectures and assignments designed to inspire, experiment, and expand your artist's eye. Learn more and see our full list of virtual and destination workshops at HesslerCreative.com. What are your career goals for the next couple of years? How do you see your work potentially changing or evolving? I'd like to be able to implement some of the like educational farming practices that I've benefited from along the way here. And I think the the owners are are really receptive to that idea. So I think I'm going to stick it out here and see what I can do with my platform that I have and, and try to show people that might not have had ac- the access that I've had some of the benefits of living this kind of lifestyle. I feel like I'd honor the privilege that I have within my community by educating people that were not as lucky as I was. I know your partner is Italian and you'd like to one day relocate there with her to build an agro-tourism business. Are you still dreaming about moving overseas when COVID is behind us and you're ready? The dream scenario would be to open a little bed and breakfast with like a small garden and a small kitchen and just run something like that where the stress of being a full-time farmer wouldn't be as great. I feel like I'd be selling myself short if I if I didn't incorporate some kind of education into it or at least a place for people that are not as established to try to start to make a living. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences between the U.S. and Italy when it comes to agriculture and food? Well, it's it's highly regional. They've been growing one kind of thing in, in a specific area for longer than our country's even been around. And I think that's sort of, you can say that across culturally of Italy, that the areas are like very specific and very regional and people will eat in a certain way. I didn't realize that most of the Italian food that we have in America is Southern Italian because most of the Italian immigrants that came here were from the South where they didn't have a lot of money. And that had a very specific kind of food that came with it. Garlic and onions are a big thing down there. Whereas in the North where my my girlfriend is from, she was always upset at how, how much garlic our pasta and spaghetti or pizza has in it. I was just blown away that I didn't realize that they don't eat with that stuff up there. Going back to the U.S., what's U.S. agriculture getting wrong? If you go around the world and look at the way other people eat and how much money these other countries have and how unhealthy our country is, clearly we've gone astray somewhere with the amount of food that we're producing and the kind of food that we're producing. There has to be some kind of big change. What hopes do you have for the future of farming in America? I hope that it will be more accessible to people that are not supported by generational wealth. I hope it will be more honest about its history and who it's really tied to, why it's broken down the way that it is in terms of who has it and who doesn't. And I hope that it'll just be more honest. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Stephen. I really appreciated his insight on these systemic barriers that contribute to food insecurity, generational wealth, and land ownership. There are a number of incredible organizations that are working to help even the playing field in agriculture. We encourage you to donate your money, 
skills, and time to these organizations, and we've added a list with links on our blog at urbanexodus.com. Please visit our site to learn more. To read Stephen's original feature, click on the episode link on our podcast page. You can follow Stephen on Instagram at stringbeans. Stay tuned next week for my conversation with Thomas McCurdy and Bailey Hale of Ardelia Farm. We will discuss their journey from keeping backyard chickens in Philadelphia to running a flower farm and food delivery business in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. Urban Exodus is a tremendous labor of love. If you like the content we create, please consider supporting our efforts on Patreon. And if you're a small business and would like to sponsor an episode, please visit our podcast page on our website to learn more. An enormous thank you to my incredible team that have helped make this podcast possible. Production by Simone Leon, editing and writing by Ari Snyder, and music by Benjamin Bethurum. I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. Stay joyful, stay kind, stay resilient. <laughs>